again. It's good to see you back so soon. I take it you're eager to get started. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Come in! A oh, good day, Professor Paul. It is just me, Pondering Paul. Hello, Pondering Paul. What brings you here? What brings me here, you ask? Uh, yes. That's what I was going to ask. Leave the questioning up to me, Professor. Uh, now is really not a good time. I was just about to teach our friend here how, how to paint. Yes. That is exactly why I'm here. You cannot teach your friend how to paint simply by jumping in willy-nilly. To learn to paint, you must first ask the true important questions. Okay. What are the truly important questions? What exactly is painting? What is paint for that matter? What is a paintbrush? What is a palette? What is a palette knife? What is a surface? I hate to admit it, but when he's right, he's right. There really is only one logical choice for today's lesson. We must first review painting tools and material. So let's get started, shall we? You can brush the blues away by painting with Paul Cannon today. Painting is one of the oldest known forms of visual expression. Carbon dating places the cave paintings located in Western Europe at approximately 44,000 years old. This means that the art of painting predates any known written language by over 30,000 years. It's easy to see why this practice still holds such mystical wonder over even modern day humans. This leads us to our first question. What exactly is painting? Well, we can actually break this down into three elements. Painting is the application, of paint to a surface. Or we can think of it as this equation. Paint plus application plus surface equals painting. Simple enough. What is paint for that matter? This is a great question. Paint is defined as a mixture of pigment and binder. Now this is what we call an emulsion. Emulsion is essentially just a fancy word for a bunch of tiny solid particles suspended inside a liquid. You can think of this as the fake snow and water inside of a snow globe. Pigments are organic or synthetic compounds that give the paint its color, also known as its hue. I know hue. No, not that kind of hue. Gotta be this one. Not that kind of hue either. Who, him? Now you're just dating yourself. Please, try to stay focused, pop culture, Paul. Where was I? Mmm, pigments. Examples of organic pigments include umber, sienna, and ochre. These are all naturally occurring earth minerals. Examples of synthetic pigments include ultramarine blue, titanium white, and manganese violet. These are all pigments created from chemical reactions and synthesis. A binder is the liquid compound in paint. It has two jobs essentially. It acts as the vehicle for the pigment when it is wet, and the glue that holds the pigment to the surface when it is dry. Organic binders come in many forms, but are often made from fats and proteins, such as plant oils, milk proteins, 
and even egg yolks. Synthetic binders are derived often from petroleum chemicals and include acrylics, resins, and latex. In this course, we will be using acrylic paints. Now, a lot of traditionalist painters think of acrylics as subpar compared to oil paints, but as I like to say, it's not the paint that matters, it's how you use it. Acrylics are like the chameleons of the paint world. Through the use of mediums, gels, and other additives, they can take on the likeness of oils, watercolors, gouache, even encaustic. Throughout this course, I will teach you how to achieve all of these qualities with ease. We now have the first part of our painting equation complete. This brings us to application. This is the catch-all step of our equation that accounts for all the wonderful things that happen to get the paint onto the surface. Now, if you take only one thing away from this class, I want it to be this. Are you ready? There is no right way to paint. Let me repeat that. There, there is, is no, no right, right way, way to paint. paint. This can be very hard for some students to understand because it's not cut and dry. As we move on in this course, I will provide you with some common rules or best practices of painting. Your goal should be to bend, break, and reshape those rules until you find your way of painting. The tool we'll be using for the most part of our application process is a paintbrush. NQ flashback. What is a paintbrush? A paintbrush is made of a handle and bristles connected together by a ferrule. The handle of the brush can be either short or long and made of wood or plastic. The bristles come in a variety of sizes and shapes with each having a unique mark or specific purpose. Bristles come in either natural or synthetic varieties, with natural being derived from animal hair and synthetic from plastics like nylon. The bristle part of the brush is called the head, with the outermost end called the tip, the middle section called the belly, and the end connecting to the ferrule called the heel. The ferrule of the brush is made from different types of metal with various coatings. The most important part of the ferrule is the depth of the crimp. Other than a little bit of glue, this is what holds the bristles to the handle. When shopping, pay very close attention to the crimp depth, as a shallow crimp will in time lead to your brush head falling off. Whoa, prof, TMI. I suppose that may have been a bit TMI, but as the saying goes, Onto the palette and palette knife. Just like every other painting tool, the palette and palette knife come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and materials. For a palette, I prefer a heavy duty pane of glass painted on one side to middle gray. This is what I have found works best for my practice. However, a plastic palette, disposable palette pad, or even a wooden palette may better suit you. Just like a good pair of shoes, find whatever's most comfortable for you. Palette knives are used for mixing paint on the palette, but they can also be used for paint application, which we will see later on. This particular size and shaped palette knife is a great workhorse knife for any beginning painter. When choosing a palette knife, make sure you check for a strong weld between the blade and the shaft, and be sure there is some but not too much flex when pressure is applied. That pretty much covers the application tools that we will be using in this course. On to the final part of our painting equation, surface. A painting surface can be almost anything. A wooden panel? Absolutely. Panels will make for an excellent painting surface, especially if you need a smooth and rigid support. These are ideal surfaces for 
non-flexible paint films such as egg tempera or resin. If you're using a flexible paint film such as oil or acrylic, it's not necessary to have such a rigid support. Due to its versatility and cost, most painters choose to use stretched canvas. You got it. Cotton canvas, or its higher quality but much more costly counterpart, linen, are the preferred painting surfaces for a majority of painters. But canvas and linen are not the be-all end-all of painting surfaces. There is in fact a much more commonly used material surface, which is... I know this one. It's an internet meme, isn't it? As I was saying, paper is one of the most commonly used painting surfaces. It comes in a variety of weight, textures, and absorbencies. These qualities play an integral role in the way in which the paint interacts with the surface. For this course, we will be using a 400 series Strathmore 246 pound acrylic paper with linen finish. This heavyweight paper will provide us with structural integrity as well as a good tooth. Voila! Our painting equation is now complete. Now, only one more question remains. To paint or not to paint? That is the question. <sighs> to paint, duh.